This is an excerpt of The Way to Christ by Jakob Burma from Book 2. A short suggestion concerning the key to the understanding of the divine mystery, how man may achieve divine contemplation within himself. The person who wants to reach divine contemplation and speak with God within himself must follow this process and then he will reach it. 1. He shall wrap up all his thinking and reason, as well as his imagination, into one apprehension and fashion within it a strong imaginative tendency to contemplate himself, what he is, since scripture calls him an image of God, Genesis 1.27, as well as the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6.19, which dwells within him. Scripture also calls him a member of Christ and offers him Christ's flesh and blood as meat and drink. 2. Thus, he shall examine his life to find out whether he is worthy of such great grace and whether he is worthy of such a high claim from Christ. He should begin to contemplate his whole life, what he has done, and how he passes his time. He shall see whether he discovers himself in Christ, whether he also stands in God's will, or wherever else he is inclined, whether he finds a will within him, within him which gladly looks towards God and gladly would be holy. 3. And has he finds such a deeply hidden will within himself, and gladly would turn himself to God's grace if he only could, then he ought to know that this same will is the incorporated Logos of God, which was spoken into him in paradise after the committing of the sin. He should also know that God, Jehovah, as the Father, also draws him to Christ, for in our own egocentricity we have no will to obedience. 4. And the same compulsion of the Father, as the incorporated, inculcated grace, draws all men from their false activities, even the most godless, in parentheses, where he is not quite like a thistle, but is willing to be quiet for a moment, and parenthesis. 5. So that no person is caused to doubt God's grace, when at some future date he finds a desire to be converted. 6. The same shall not be put off for one moment, as it is written, Today when you hear the Lord's voice, do not plug up your ears and hearts. Hebrews 3, 7-8, and Psalms 95, 7-9. 7. For the desire for future conversion is God's voice in man, which the devil, by his imported images, covers up and hinders, so that it is postponed from one day to the next, until the soul finally becomes a thistle and can no longer reach grace. 8. Let such a person merely do this thing in his perceptive apprehension and look to his whole life course, and measure it with God's Ten Commandments and with the Gospel's love, which bids him love his neighbor as he loves himself, so that in Christ's love he will be a child of grace. Let him see how far he has wandered away from this and what his daily practice and desire is. Then the Father's compulsion and God's righteousness will be directed into him, revealing the self-fabricated images in his heart, which he loves in place of God, and which he held and still holds as his best treasure. 9. These images will be, 1. Vanity, love of self, and a wish to honor of others. Furthermore, this will be an image of power and authority for his arrogance. In honor, he wants to raise himself above all others. 2. Secondly, it will be the swine image, avarice, which wants to possess everything. If he owned the world in heaven, then he would also want to rule hell. He, he covets more than he needs for his temporal life. He has no inner faith in God, but he is a sottish swine which seeks to draw everything to himself. 3. There will be an image of envy in him, sneering at other hearts and not willing to tolerate their having more temporal wealth and honor than he. 4. There will be wrath which envy raises up in itself as a poison and because of unimportant things flies up, strikes, raves, and seeks to justify itself. 5. There will also be within him a heap of many hundreds of earthly animals which he loves. For he does love everything that is of the world, placing it in Christ's stead, honoring it more than God. Just look at his words, how his mouth secretly slanders other people, producing evil by his deeds, often speaking evil without sure basis, rejoicing in and wishing misfortune upon his neighbor. This all is the devil's hoofs and horns and the serpent's image which he bears within, within him. 10. Then he shall compare these with God's word and law and gospel, and he shall see that he is more beast and devil than true man. Then shall he clearly see how these fancied and inherited images alienate and divert him from God's kingdom. He shall often see how, when he really wants to repent and convert himself and change himself towards God, these devil hoofs delay and divert him from it. He shall see that the poor soul imagines that these grub worms are divine, and it places its inclinations in them again, remaining within God's wrath and finally stepping into the abyss, when the grace and the compulsion of the Father are extinguished. 11. To such a person we reveal our own process. As soon as he becomes conscious of these beasts, 
that same hour and minute he shall resolve and determine within his soul that he wants to forsake the bestial volition and turn to God in repentance. And through the, though he cannot accomplish this in his own energies, he should appropriate Christ's prophecies to himself. For Christ said, Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. No son asks bread of the father, and he offers him a stone, or an egg, and he is offered a scorpion. If ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him for it? Luke 11, 13. 12. Let him incorporate this promise into his heart, for it is poison and death to the devil, and to all inherited and fabricated beasts. Let him come before God in his prayers the same hour with these infused and prophesied words. Let him turn all these abominable, abominable beasts, of which he himself is one, to no effect. Let him reflect that he is nothing else than a sodded swineherd who has wasted his parental inheritance and his filial rights with the world's swine and with evil animals. Let him realize that he now stands before God's countenance as nothing more than a miserable, naked, tattered swineherd who has dissipated and philandered his parental inheritance with the world's bestial images, and that he has no righteous claim to God's grace and is unworthy of it. Much less can he be called a Christian and a child of God. And he shall despair of all those good works which he has ever done, for they only proceeded out of that shiny veneer of godliness, by which the man-devil wants to be known as an angel. For scripture says that without faith God cannot be pleased. 13. But he is not to despair of God's grace, only of his own self and of his own powers and capabilities. He should humble his soul before God with all his might, even though his heart says nothing but, No, wait, this is not the day for it. Or, your sins are too great, you cannot come to God's graciousness. Then shall he also become anxious, so that he cannot pray to God nor receive comfort or strength in his heart, so that it seems as if his soul has become wholly blind and dead to, dead to God. But he shall stand fast and hold God's prophecies as certain and unfailing truth, sighing to God with depressed heart and surrendering himself to him in all his unworthiness. 14. And though he judges himself too unworthy and strange, so that the inheritance of Christ no longer belongs to him and he seems to have lost his right, then he should consider seriously what Christ says. He came to seek and to save that which is lost as the poor sinner, dead and blind to God. This promise he is to appropriate, and makes such a strong decision within himself that he will not forsake the promised grace of God in Christ, even though he should not attain assurance of forgiveness all the days of his life. Yet God's promise will be worth more than all the comfort which he may experience. 15. And he, and he shall resolve and completely concentrate his will and determination, so that he never again wants to enter into the old bestial images and depravity. And so he shall mourn with all his swine and animals for their shepherd. And even though he should want to become a fool to the world, yet he should want to remain firm in his decision and in God's prophecy of grace. But if he is a child of death, then he wants to be in Christ's death with Christ's promises, dying and living as he will. Let him but direct his resolution to God in steadfast prayer and sighing, and let him commit all the beginning and acts of his trade to God, remaining passive in his imagination of avarice, envy, and arrogance. Let him but surrender these three beasts, then the other animals will begin to weaken and sicken, approaching death. For soon Christ will come to him again in his promised word which he presses into him, and with which he envelops him, assuming the life form. He will begin to work within him by which his prayers will increase and become invigorated more and more in the spirit of grace. 16. Just as a progenital sperm works in the mother womb, growing in spite of many natural rebuffs and external circumstances until the child achieves life in the mother womb, so it also goes with him. The more man removes himself from images, the more he enters into God until Christ becomes alive and incorporated grace, which takes place in great earnestness of purpose. Thereupon the marriage of the Virgin Sophia begins when the two lovers experience each other in joy and interpenetrate each other with the inner, inmost desire of the sweetest love of God. Then the marriage of the Lamb is prepared in a short time when the Virgin Sophia, in parentheses, as the actual humanity of Christ, in parentheses, is wedded to the soul. And what happens then, and what kind of joy transpires? Christ suggests by referring to the great joy over the repentant sinner who shall be considered before God's eyes and all angels within the heaven within man, for more than nine, ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. Luke 15, 7. 17. We have neither pen nor words to write or to tell what the sweet grace of God in Christ's humanity is like, and what happens to those who are worthy to come to the marriage of the Lamb, which we ourselves have experienced in our own person, and which we know, so that it has become the real ground of our writings. We gladly have passed this along to our brethren and brethren in Christ's love. If it is possible for them to believe our childlike counsel, they will experience in themselves that that from which this simple hand understands and knows such great secrets. 18. Since we already have written a detailed tract of true repentance and of true regeneration, 
we shall leave off here with only a mere instruction, directing the reader himself to it, as well as to the big work of Genesis. There the ground of all that which he may ask will be found in enough detail, and in a Christian manner. We admonish him to follow in this process, and then he shall come to divine contemplation within himself, learning what the Lord says to him in Christ. And herewith we commend him to the grace of God.